So, how does it feel when you play Roll Up to Win with Tim Hortons? Buy a hot or cold beverage using the Tim's app and find out. Roll in the app for a chance to win prizes ranging from free coffee and donuts to a Universal Orlando Resort vacation or a sweet car. Oh, don't forget the TV. And this year, every roll is a shot at a $1,000 daily giveaway drawing for two $500 prizes. Roll up to win and get treated by Tim's. No purchase necessary. Account registration required. 50 U.S. and D.C. 18 plus enter by 4223. See rules at rolluptowin.com for free entry and full details. Void in Florida and where prohibited. Mother's Day is coming. And if you don't get mom the perfect gift, she won't be angry. Just disappointed. So go with drinks from Drizzly, the go-to app for alcohol delivery. Send favorites near, far, or to wherever the moms in your life are. Download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com and get the best drinks to the best moms and plenty of time for Mother's Day. Ding dong, it's Drizzly. Must be 21 plus. Not available in all locations. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of JavaScript Jabber. This week on our panel, we have AJ O'Neill. Yo, 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 coming at you live from absolutely perfect paradise, Virginia, aside from the bad internet. Dan Shapir. Coming to you from, well, interesting Israel. Steve Edwards. Howdy from sunny and clear Portland. I'm Charles Max Wood from devchat.tv. Just a quick shout out. We do have now a premium podcast offering Currently, it is ad-free episodes. We are looking at what other options we can add to it to make it more exciting, but you can go find it at devchat.tv slash premium. And this week, we have a special guest on the show, and that is Vitaly Zaidman. Vitaly, do you want to just say hello to everybody, remind everyone who you are and what you do? Yes, hello from Tel Aviv. I've been a software developer for the last nine years. I work in a software solutions company in the world software. Great company, by the way. And I got to work on many projects, many technologies. Many, I worked with a lot of teams, processes. So I know things about tech, mostly about the web. And now I'm leaving my job and I'm moving to London and uh, I'm looking for a job in London. So uh, you know how to find me, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you and Dan won't be neighbors anymore. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, the, the yeah, barbecues, it's going to be sad. Yeah, but we live in this global sort of, uh, of a world of an economy, right? I mean, uh, with with Twitter and Facebook and whatnot, you have friends all over the place, or sort of these internet friends. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sure. But but the virtual barbecues just aren't the same. So yeah, so let's just dive right in here. I mean, maybe you can uh, browser cache your barbecue. I don't know. The title is browser caching. That, that was a joke worthy of Steve Edwards. No, mine get laughs. Well, they should, at least. I don't know about that one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, th- and this is something that I always run into. It's like, okay, it's like, okay, I'm going to add some characters on to bust the cache, make it reload stuff. But yeah, it's not something that I really think about other than, oh, my framework does this for me, right? This episode is sponsored by Sentry. Sentry is the thing that I put into all of my apps. First, I figure out how to deploy them. I get them up on the web. Then I run Sentry on them. And the reason why is because I need to know what's going on in my app all the time. Yeah, I'm kind of a control freak. What can I say? The other reason is, is that sometimes I miss stuff or I run things in development. You know, it works on my machine. We've all been there, right? And then it gets up in the cloud or up on a server and stuff happens and stuff breaks, right? I didn't configure it right. I'm an idiot and I didn't put the AWS credential in. I didn't do that last week, right? That wasn't me. Anyway, I need that error reported back. Hey, Chuck, I can't connect to AWS. The other thing is, is that this is something that my users often will give me information on. And that's, hey, it's too slow. It's not performing right. And I need to know it's slowing down because I don't want them going off to Twitter when they're supposed to be using my app. And so they need to tell me it's not fast enough. And Sentry does that, right? I put Sentry in. It gives me all the performance data. And I can go, hey, that takes three seconds to load. That's way too long. And I can go in and I can fix those issues. And then I'm not losing users to Twitter. So if you have an app that's running slow, if you have an app that's having errors, or if you just have an app that you're getting started with and you want to make sure that it's running properly all the time, then go check it out. They support all major languages and frameworks. They recently added support for Next.js, which is cool. You can go sign up at sentry.io slash sign up. That's easy to remember, right? If you use the promo code JSJabber, you can get three free months on their base team plan. Before we dive into it, in preparation 
for our conversation today. I went ahead and started uh, reading uh, the MDN chapter on the cache control HTTP response header setting because MDN is the best. And I have to quote a part of it back to you because I think it kind of frames this entire discussion. So one of the directives there is the no-cache directive. And here is the description of no cache. The response may be stored by any cache, even if the response is normally non-cacheable. In other words, no cache means that it can be cached. You gotta love that. <laughs> Logical. Uh, hey, real quick. Thought. There's one thing at the top of the notes that I think is important leading in about the famous statement from Phil Carlton that says there's two hard things in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. Actually, that's incorrect. There's two hard things computer in computer science, cache and validation, naming things, and off by one errors. So I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, that is well known. But, mm-hmm. but yes, cache, cache and validation is certainly hard, especially hard in, in a distributed and not, uh, let's call it, not reliable system like the web, intentionally not reliable. So it makes the caching even more challenging. But, but that said, I, I am amused by the fact that caching on the web, the various values that you can put in the in the cache uh, control header are very, let's call it, not intuitive to say the least. And I guess that that's what we're going to talk about today, no? Yeah, I guess that's, uh, yeah, actually exactly. So uh, I was amused by how things were cached on my website, on the website that I work on. Uh, Actually, a few years ago for the first time, and I researched it then, but I forgot that I researched it then by now because it's so not intuitive. So every time I work on it, I have to read the documentation uh, from start to end. Like I always read it when I uh, start working with it because there's so many variables, so many things that you need to remember. Yeah, so what I saw basically was that I had images and these images were uh, seemingly the same. And I started uh, like doing all this, like trying to understand why they are cached differently and it was consistent. Some images were uh, served from the browser, from the memory, which means that to get, I don't know, dog dog.jpg, you don't even have to go to the network. That's the fastest scenario, obviously. You just get it from the browser, uh, the browser cache. Some images were served using the 304 uh, header, which means that the browser makes a request. The server basically says that, yeah, it's cached. And uh, some requests were giving me like other codes. 200 and it was and I couldn't find what's the difference between them so I'm going to talk in a moment what was exactly the difference and uh, how it works so before we get going too far Vitaly I always like to go back and address some basic stuff because a lot of times we get into talking about complex things without explaining why it's important or what it is in the first place so for someone who's listening who might not understand caching here's the way I'll explain it so My first dealings with caching came with working in PHP-based sites, Drupal websites, et cetera. And the idea is that you have your your PHP code, your server code that goes and queries a database to get data to display, turn around and send to your templating system or however it is that you are displaying your data. And if it's the same data over and over that the same that people are requesting, you don't want to have to make the make the request down to the database, get the data, and return it. So instead, you cache, you store it already rendered, or however you want to do it in, a, in something like a reverse proxy server, server like Varnish. I know it was a real popular one. So that it's real quick to get the data. It's already there. You return it. You have a fast response time instead of making that whole run down to the database. And so. The idea of caching is just to speed things up, to save things that don't need to be completely re-rendered on every call. And then it just makes your site much more responsive. You know, going back, I can remember when Facebook first started, for instance, and they were using PHP and MySQL. And one of the first tools I can recall them coming up with to help with this was called BigPipe. 
And it was basically a PHP caching mechanism that could be used. And it was incorporated into Drupal. And I don't know about how many other places. So that it was an easy way for you to get your data stashed somewhere so that's easily easily accessible without making that full run. And in some cases, you can do stuff like store already rendered data in your database, in cache tables. And then there's stuff like uh, Redis you can use, you know, reverse proxies like Varnish. There's any number of tools. But anyway, I just wanted to get out there the whole explanation of caching, what it is and why it's important. And so then as we go and talk about details, you know, we know why we're doing all this in the first place. Yeah, it's, it's great that you mentioned these points because it's indeed really important. At the end of the day, like you said, caching is intended to essentially speed things up. Uh, so it's either by avoiding recalculations. So it's kind of like another way to do memoization. You, you do the calculation once, you save the value somewhere, and then you reuse that saved value instead of doing the calculation all over again. So that's one basic benefit of caching. And you gave the example of avoiding some sort of a lengthy database query, but it could literally be any sort of a computation. And the other is to get the data back from somewhere close and fast rather than going somewhere further and slower. So again, it could be getting the data from the local browser cache, which is obviously on your own device, rather than going over the network to get it from some server somewhere, which is going to take a longer time. Another example of caching might be even within your own computer itself. The CPU has a caching mechanism so that instead of going out to the slower RAM, it can actually get the cache data from a faster uh, storage that's right, that's on in the, inside the CPU itself. So all of these are essentially the same technique applied in in various layers and structures and places within computing. And we are going to talk about a specific case of caching, which is caching on the web, which is either the browser caching a server response or a proxy server in between the browser and the server caching a response value, or maybe even the server itself caching something in order to avoid recalculation. Is that do you agree with our description, Vitali? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I wanted to start, when we talk about the browser cache, I wanted to start by talking about the cache control header, which is a header that basically when you make a request to the server, it describes to the browser how to cache the response. That, that's like in chart. And it's really, really important to use cache control. And I'm going to explain why it's so important to use it. Because if you don't use it, you, your browser has a heuristic. Uh, your browser has some kind of default uh, behavior. And uh, it determines uh, how to cache things in a very, very unexpected way. And, that what, and that is what I encountered a few months ago. Basically, if you don't don't have cache control, your browser looks at the when your asset was uh, less modified. So let's say you make a request to a.jpg, okay, to an image, and and the asset comes with a modified date that states that it was modified 100 days ago. Your browser will cache this asset automatically for 10 days. So it's the difference between today and the less date when it was modified divided by 10 okay so you might be in a situation where you didn't want to cache anything and suddenly you see like your website doesn't update for some reason things on your website doesn't update and it happens because the browser has default behavior when it caches uh, caches things so it's very very i really don't advise using this method super intuitive that's why we have the cache control uh, header. And in the cache control header, we have many options that tell the browser how to act. So we can use private or public. Actually, I don't think we're going to talk about all of them. I think the most important of them is max age, I guess. It basically tells the browser that what you receive here is going to be stored for this and that amount of time on the browser. And your browser will serve this asset from 
the browser without making any network request for that amount of time. Now, it's super convenient and super fast, but it has its drawbacks because you might be in a situation where you want to update something, but it doesn't update. And it might be, you can catch things for a whole year in this way. So uh, it's a really good thing to do, but also might be kind of dangerous. So yeah, I'd, li I'd like to give an example for that, if I may. Yeah. So let's say I'm, I'm running some sort of an online news service, a newspaper or whatever. And I don't want, I, you know, I get a lot of traffic and I don't want to overload my servers. And I also want to provide fast responses. So I could say, you know, usually I don't update my, my front page more often than once every 10 minutes. So I'll set the max age appropriately. And that way, for I, I get this. I did, I'm sure that if the if somebody visits the same uh, my my site twice within that ten minutes, they the the second visit won't actually load my servers because they'll use their local content. They'll also get it really fast, so they'll be happy. But then some breaking news happens, and I update my site. But unfortunately, it's I updated it right at the beginning of that. 10 minute cycle for somebody and they they maybe they heard from somebody that there's this really important thing happening and they immediately refresh try to refresh the site but because of the way in which my caching is configured they'll potentially get that same story all over again and then because of that they they'll be disappointed with my site they'll go somewhere else and once they go somewhere else there's a chance they'll never come back so you really need to be careful with these types of things. And, and that's, that's one example. Other, there are other examples where I potentially, you know, I don't know, have bugs in my HTML because I deployed a new version. And then yeah, I try to correct it and I can't because uh, people are using the cached version that has the bug. So, so, you know, there are all sorts of scenarios where caching can be problematic when you cannot remotely force a cache to clear. I think the other that's one that the comes to mind is... Part. Oh. You get a DMCA claim against uh, an image or something on your website that you've told people to cache, things like that. Hmm. Haven't had that. I've had that on the podcast. Yeah, that's definitely a scenario that, that can they be cache your media. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think the biggest problem is when things break because of caching, because things are running at different versions. The front end is now running at a different version than the back end, or the HTML is a different version than the JavaScript. That's where I see it being really problematic. Yeah. The idea of static assets being cached, I think this is good. The problem is that we don't want dynamic applications being cached so much. Yeah, but the whole distinction between static and dynamic can become really tricky sometimes. I mean, because at the end of the day, everything is, I guess, is dynamic. It's just that the time frames are different. Well, <laughs> you can put it like that, yeah. I, I like the idea of how we used to do it back a decade ago, where you just hash the assets, and then in the production version, you just have the version of the file plus a dot, and then the hash of the file, or a truncated version of the hash of the file, and then dot whatever the extension is. So you have main dot some random looking characters dot js, and main dot some random character look random looking characters dot css. I think that that worked out pretty well, and I don't, I don't quite understand why. It seems like in the web and, and just in the world in general, whenever people are at the pinnacle of success, that's when they just abandon everything and go backwards. <laughs> well, uh, well, I have to tell you that actually that's exactly what we do at Wix. So when we consider static assets like uh, JavaScript files or images, they all, they all have a CRC as part of their path. So uh, as long as, so, and, and then we just set their, their cache to be like, like, like Vitali said, for as long as the web essentially allows, which might be a year. Sometimes we set it a little less, but essentially from our perspective, they're, they're immutable. And it's when, when the, something needs to change, what changes is the HTML itself. And the HTML is the thing that references the versions that it, or knows the different versions or CRCs that it needs to use. So we, we use exactly the method that you described, AJ. 
but we still can't don't get away from the fact that then it becomes a question of whether or not to cache the HTML itself. Because never cache index.html and you'll never regret it. Well, that, uh, that's problematic because uh, <laughs> Sorry. because because yeah, because then you start to get into all sorts of things like how your time to first byte compares with the time to first byte of other type of solutions. And you know we had a guest here talking about the Gemstack recently. And part of the Gemstack, for example, is pushing resources onto a CDN. So at the very least, they're cached on the CDN. And the, the website itself, that its version is, you know, it's not versioned in its HTML. So so it's well if you if you're using React, you don't have to worry about that because there is no HTML in your index.html. It's just a script. Uh, yeah. There you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah problem yeah. problem no. solved. I mean, it's th- this is the part of it that makes it hard, or at least one of the things is that if you have a large index.html or you have a lot of things that move around on the index.html or both, then it's, okay, which parts do I cache? How do I cache? Can I cache on the back end in order to speed up the load for the work time on the back end so I can spit it up faster? And then, you know, on the front end, yeah, how do I let somebody know that something's updated so that they can get it with, but otherwise they get it faster. And yeah, there are a lot of things that go on here that I I don't think there's going to be a one size fits all, right? Where you kind of imply just don't ever cache the index page. I, I, I don't know if that's realistic for everybody. But in some cases, yeah, it may be a terrible idea. And then in other cases, it may save you a ton of work on your server, and it may be a better experience for your users. And so you have to be able to make that call. Can we agree so if that you, caching yeah. falls within the realm of pre-optimization or, or not the realm of, but in the realm of risk of pre-optimization? Oh, definitely. I think it's yeah. one of the most widespread uh, pre-optimizations for sure. People are uh, obsessed with caching before they even have a reason to do it like all the time. But if you're be- building a progressive web app, for example, you want to cache your index HTML because you want your users to access your website when their phones are offline, right? Mm -hmm. But then what you're doing, right? Because like if your index HTML is cached and all the resources are cached, how do you even update your website ever? Uh, So one of the ways to do it is to use service workers where they first make a request. If it's not there, then they're using the cached version. But very cool thing you can do, and obviously it doesn't fit all the websites, on, on the, some of them, is I guess you also on many web apps where you go to a website and it loads really, really fast and then shows you it, like some kind of pop-up jumps and tells you to refresh the page to receive a new version or to click the button to receive the new version. So basically they cache index HTML and they always serve it to you. They might even download the new version on the background and the moment you click refresh, that's it. You receive the new version. So that's one way to do it. Yeah, I, I think we kind of talked about some of this stuff also when we spoke with uh, Jake Archibald from Google. I mean, I like to make a distinction between cache control, the cache control headers, and the behavior of uh, service workers. And they don't they approach a problem from, from a completely different angle and they should not be considered like replacements for each other exactly. Obviously, there's overlap. But with with cache control, it's declarative. You tell the browser what you would like for it to do and, you know, (laughs) hope for the best. With uh, service workers, you literally implement the caching yourself. You write the caching code in JavaScript. You implement Mm -hmm. a a client-side proxy and in its... And it's yours to do and yours to break. And the end result is that it gives you total control, but it also gives you the total ability to completely shoot yourself in the foot. And, you know. <laughs> yep. So, so, so when do you make the call? When, where's the, what, when do you start thinking about, is this worth the trade-off? Well, I can just say that from my perspective. First, my perspective is always get the cash control right. So regardless of whether or not you're going to be using a service worker, from implement proper values in the cache control, because as Vitaly correctly said, if you don't, 
you will likely fall into scenarios where the browser tries to make fill in the gaps and it's mm-hmm. always beneficial to be explicit about these sort of things and the control really at the point of the of the initial decision making the control is at the hands of the server where it should be because the data is coming from the server so the one providing the data has the most context about how long that data is fresh then if like Vitali said, if you want to have the ability to work offline, then you can introduce or, or do really sophisticated things that for some reason you can't do with the built-in cache control headers, then I go ahead and implement a service worker. But then you better know what you're about and have really good testing because if you screw up caching, pardon my French, it's a very difficult problem to fix. Yeah, I saw a collage a few days ago of uh, like uh, of Twitter threads where companies ask their users to refresh the page, like to do hard reload, right? Because they're stuck in this scenario. And it happened a lot, like cases where uh, people are starting to call support in panic and the support has to explain to sometimes hundreds of thousands of people or even more how to do this hard reload thingy. And <laughs> trust me, that's a place where you don't want to be. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, okay. We'll... So if, if you're talking about this extreme, yeah. So, sorry, Chuck, I interrupted you. No, I was going to start moving into some of the other areas because there are other things that I see people talk about when we talk about caches that, yeah, anyway. So when you get to this extreme, what were you going to say? Yeah, the other extreme is to not cache at all. So if you set your cache control to no store, then it's not okay. cached. And as Dan said, if you set it to no cache, it does something different a little. Can uh, you explain maybe the difference between... Yeah, yeah, I'll explain the difference. So no store makes sure that this particular request, whether it's request to a server or to an asset or whatever, will not cache will be not cached anywhere. So if you have some important thing, like, I don't know, a request, if it has to do like with uh, banking or whatever, you don't want to cache it anywhere. Obviously, it's not the only scenario, but so it's called no star. And if you use no cache, then it uses e-tags and it makes, it basically calls the server and asks it if the version that the browser has is the most fresh version. So how etex work, the moment you download an image for the first time, you receive not only images, every, any asset. The moment you download it for the first time, you receive status codes 200 and you and you receive an etag. And this etag is a unique ID that identifies your asset. So later you can make a request to the server and it uses, it sends this e-tag along with the request that asks for this asset. And if the server sees that the e-tag didn't change, so basically you have the freshest version of an asset in your hands, then it sends you the code 304, not, modif- mod- not modified. And basically it means that your browser can use the version that it has and it doesn't have to download the asset itself. Only the answer from the server that your version is fresh. Yeah, I think that's the key to understand between the di- the, dif- the key difference between no cache and no store, which is that no store, like Vitali said, basically says, don't store a copy in your cache. You, you're not allowed to cache this content for because I right. said so. Whereas no cache says, well, you can store the copy, but you're not allowed to use it before revalidating with the server that it's still fresh. And it might be, so an example that was given was using an e-tag, which you know usually is some sort of a checksum or CRC or whatever on, the, on that resource. So if it stayed the same, it's, a, it's the indication that the version that you have is, is still fresh and still usable. Of course, that e tags are optional. I mean, you don't. You know, the server can send down an e tag, or it can right. decide not to send down an e tag if it, you know, doesn't want to. Yeah, it's just something that comes in the header, right? 
yeah, it's it's another field in the head in the response header. Yeah, for example, if if we go back to the example of immutable resources, resources that never change, we, like we talked about static resources, like an image that maybe has a CRC as part of the URL itself, where there's no point in also sending the CRC down as an e tag because it will never change. So why check if it's changed? Just a word about CRC. So. Basically, we want to use content hashes. We, we want to, even if we, for example, even if our website has changed, but several files didn't change, we want to use hashes on file names. So it's file name that some kind of hash, that uh, extension that represents this particular version of this file. So if the file didn't change, you still receive the same content hash. And Webpack does okay. that for you, I think, right? In Webpack, when you when you output your files, you can if you use like a file loader, you can choose between mm-hmm. content hash and basically just a hash. And hashes are created faster than content hashes, but they're less reliable. Yeah, the way I use Webpack or the way I have it configured, I've I've been getting the hashes. I know that a lot of frameworks will do it for you too if they have some other pipeline for managing status static assets. Yeah, in Next.js, for example, you can configure. Next.js to use e tags automatically. So it, uh, yeah, Rails does it, it too. You can turn on e tags. Yeah, and it works like from the client side and also from the server side. So it's really nice in uh, Next.js. I assume there's a way to turn off e tags in Express.js, but they are on by default. Yes, there, there's, yeah, exactly. There, there's a way to turn it off. Yes. Yeah, look, it doesn't usually do any harm. I mean, uh, it's uh, the browser just remembers that value that it got in the response center and sends it back in the request. You know, the server doesn't need it because it knows that the content never changes. It can just ignore it. It can always just ignore it, by the way. It's totally the server's decision what to do about the e-tag. The only drawback I can think about it is that uh, generating e-tags might be a little costly, but I think if you have this problem, you probably have like a very, very unbelievable traffic. So I don't think that e-tags would generally be costly because usually you're using something like a SHA sum and the CPU cost of doing a SHA sum on content is... Typically, very minor. Yeah, probably. Even for like huge assets, I don't know, megabytes, whatever. Well, the asset was going to be served anyway. Yeah, and it's going to be compressed likely anyway. So, you know, calculating a SHA sum is is cheaper than compression. And there are constant time hash algorithms. I don't know what the default is in Express.js, but it would make sense... I don't know if web servers are doing this or not. I'd have to check into it to actually look at code or, or specifications. But it would totally make sense to use constant time hashes for e-tags, where it only samples, say, typically, you know, you, you can look at heuristics. You can say the first kilobyte of a file and the last kilobyte of a file are the parts that are most likely to change because that's where metadata is. And if you sample the first, the last, and then maybe two or three in the middle, you could just read in four or maybe eight kilobytes and have a 99.99% accuracy as to whether or not a file has changed. Did you work your tail off to get that senior developer gig just to realize that senior dev doesn't actually mean dream job? I've been there too. My first senior developer job was at a place where all of our triumphs were the bosses and all the failures were ours. The second one was a great place to continue to learn and grow, only for it to go under due to poor management. And now I get job offers from great places to work all the time. Not only that, but the last job interview I actually sat in was a discussion about how much my podcast had helped the people interviewing me. If you're looking for a way to get into your dream job, then join our Dev Heroes Accelerator. Not only will we help you get the kind of exposure that makes you attractive to your dream employer, but you'll be able to ask them for top dollar as well. Check it out at devheroesaccelerator.com. Yeah, well, the other thing that I see happen sometimes, and this is something that Rails does in particular, is that if it renders a, a partial part of the HTML, then it can generate kind of a fragment hash and work off of that. The other thing that I've seen it do is use a hash on the object as opposed to a hash on the generated HTML as a stand-in. 
and actually skip all of the rendering and then be able to generate that e tag even more quickly, right? So if the if the HTML request is just loading in a page that only renders basically the information off of the off of that one object, then yeah, it doesn't need to go through the render steps. It knows whether or not it needs to uh, clear the cache based on whether or not that object has changes in it or any of the objects that it's composed from has changes in it. So it'll it'll kind of cheat and not do the rest of the work and then hand down an e tag or a hash that's already telling it, hey, this is all the same, right? And then you can have JavaScript or something else on the front end, Stimulus or React or something like that, that will come back and actually update like anything that looks like a feed or anything that needs to pull extra information from the site later on. But an important thing to remember when using e-tags is that, yes, it can say avoid the, the data download, because if the e-tag doesn't change, like Vitaly said, you just get a 304 response that says basically use what you've got. But it does not avoid the round trip to the server. Right. And if you're, let's say, on some mobile device and some sort of a slow network because, I don't know, you're traveling overseas or whatever, <laughs> that that duration can be lengthy in and of itself. So it's it's not like you're going to get instant response because you're quote-unquote caching. There's still a price to pay when you're relying on, on data that requires revalidation. That's which, true. Thanks for brings, clarifying that. Which brings me to, to another point that I wanted to ask you. So uh, we covered three cache directives. Uh, no cache, no store, max age. Are there others that you want to, to mention and cover? Yeah. So we have public and private, and they determine if uh, an information is private for that single user only, which is the private one, and it would not be stored on shared caches. There are more caveats caveats to it, but when you cache things, just remember that you don't want to cache things on places where you're not allowed to cache it or where it might be problematic to cache it. I think, Chuck, you talked about one of these cases, right? Can, can you give a, uh, an example of, or, or describe the difference between a private and a public cache? Yeah, for example, if I have a private picture that the user uploaded, you want to save it in a private place, for example. That's the most obvious one. But I also mean what is a private cache versus a public cache? I mean that, for example, like a private cache would be the cache in your own browser, on your own device, in your own session or operating system session. So that would be a private a private cache for you. But if it's if there's like a proxy in the middle and it caches a response, that's a public cache because theoretically it could be used by anybody who's going to that proxy, right? Yeah, I wonder if a private cache can also be on the web somewhere. Well, theoretically, I could construct a private cache, but that would assume, assume that I know exactly who the user is that uh, is going through that connection. If, if, I, if I was able to totally validate that user, you know, then I could also have a private cache in, in the cloud. I'm not sure that there, that there would be value for that because if I can... Well, maybe I know if a user potentially switching between devices then I could theoretically cache across devices for that user. That could be that could be interesting. Yeah, you could have theoretically a private cache in the cloud. Why not? In the context of private of a private and public cache, I think it's also worthwhile to mention the S max age uh, setting, which is similar to max age, but actually controls overrides max age for shared caches. So you could actually use it to specify different durations for content in a private cache versus a public cache. And what always gets me is that max age is written max dash age, but as max age is written as dot dash max age without a dash in the middle of max age, just to confuse us all. And believe me, I've seen cases where people wrote it wrong. Yeah, I also wanted to to just remind you to I just wanted to remind you that Internet Explorer works differently. So just take it into account. And if you need to support <laughs> it, then uh, what? read about how it works. <laughs> that no! is shocking. Say it isn't so. 
Yeah. <laughs> I will add the link actually that uh, explains how Instant Explorer works with cache control for people uh, like me who struggle to make sure that uh, things are supported there. Even Microsoft is end of life to Internet Explorer. How how long how long do we need to continue to support? As it? long as enough of your users are using it. Yeah. As far as I understand, some uh, government entities still use Internet Explorer eight and nine. So I don't know, man. Some government entities still use Windows Vista, but but yeah, it's sad. I do have to give props to Microsoft in this regard that the new Edge can be installed on older. Windows operating system versions, unlike the old Edge, which could only be installed on the very latest Windows versions. I know that that's a somewhat confusing statement. But thanks to that, you can actually deploy Edge as a replacement for Internet Explorer on older uh, Windows devices. And before we run out of cache control settings, I have to also discuss the partially experimental stale while we validate setting which i think is amazing and partially eliminates the needs for service workers in some cases okay well what is it then because i like service workers i think they're cool they're kind of a pain sometimes but they're cool well no i I like them as well and i said in some cases the idea with stale while we validate basically means that if you've got a version of that resource, which is stay, which mm-hmm. means that you know it's it's potentially outdated. And in the past, you would, like we talked about, you would send a request maybe with an e-tag, and then the server could tell you, yes, you can keep on using it even though it's old, or it would say, no, here, use this version instead. But the, the cost is that at the very least, you're, you've got the delay of the round trip, which, as we mentioned, could be even if it can be non-trivial. And if a new version needs to be downloaded, well, then you need to wait for the new version to arrive. Stay while we validate literally means that you can you you send a request for the fresh content in the background and continue using the stale content just this time. So uh, let's say you. You visit. We were giving that example of that of that uh, newspaper. You, if you have stale while we validate, you will show the previous edition. But the next time you load it, you will get the new, the new edition because it sent the request and got the new edition in the background while you were reading the older version. So you get this benefit of a really fast response, and and but a guaranteed freshness for the next time. Uh, and the setting is stale while we validate with uh, equals a number, which basically just tells you how long you can still use that stale version. If that time expires, then you need to wait for the new version to arrive before uh, showing it to, to, the, to the visitor. Yeah, it, it might be amazing. I think I, can really, I really would like to use it, for sure. Yeah, obviously you need to be careful with that because there are scenarios where it's not a good idea. For example, I don't know, let's say you're showing uh, your your bank balance to somebody. Uh, it's not a good idea to show <laughs> your old bank balance under any circumstances. So, so yeah, so even with that sort of a setting, you need to be careful. But it's definitely a way, if you're okay with serving an old version like that one time, then it could uh, potentially provide a really significant performance boost relative very easily and and fairly cheaply i think we can right. uh, see something like this with profile pictures sometimes you receive the old one even though like you updated your profile picture already but on your next next time you look at it it's already it's already updated i don't know do you know how long steve edwards spends grooming for his profile pictures and he updates it like six times a day it's gonna hurt his it's feelings it's hard to groom when i have no hair but unless there's other things we need to talk about. But. Oh, you've got eyebrows, no? Yeah, I got to trim those once in a while, but that's about it. <laughs> Shave every few days, I'm good to go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. All right, any other aspects to this? One other thing that I was wondering about is CDNs, right? So I keep hearing CDNs, but then you don't always have control either on like cache and validation and stuff like that, right? Because so What's a CDN real quick, Chuck? Content Delivery <laughs> Network. Thank you. I'm like, I was like, it rolls off my tongue until you ask me. And then 
And so, what is so a CDN? That, and what is a so CDN? That, so uh, really, Steve, what you were doing is wasn't really asking Chuck. You were giving, you were like pop quiz, a, pop quiz, exactly. Well, no, I wanted him to explain it, but I assumed he knew what the letters meant. I guess I was wrong. That's uh, yeah. Never so. So essentially, yeah, it's a place up in the cloud. There's usually a set of distributed servers across the globe where you can put your static assets so that people theoretically can download the assets from a server that's closer to them, shortening the round trip and thereby making the thing load faster. That's the theory. Yeah. And to add to that, they usually operate as a series of proxies. So right. uh, w- once you put the content somewhere, then it gets replicated or you go through to the, the, the servers up to the level where that content exists. But when, when it downloads the stuff, it, it keeps a copy of it. So like I said, it's a proxy. And we talked mm-hmm. about shared storage. That's exactly the example of shared storage caching. Yeah, in fact, most of the CDNs that I've used, they'll keep a fresh copy of the stuff that you tell them to. But then in a lot of cases, they'll move stuff that doesn't get hit as often. So as long as it's getting repeatedly and frequently downloaded, they'll keep it in the cache, right? Because they want to serve it quickly. But if it's not, then a lot of times they'll move it to a slower cache, basically, or to hard disk. Yeah, but that's true. Yeah, There are usually a lot of configurations on CDNs. Yeah. Of this type, like uh, for example, some CDNs invalidate assets after they've been in the, their own cache for like I don't know two days or three days or a week, and then when the next user makes a request, it refreshes it only the, it refreshes the asset only then. Yeah, in fact, most uh, media services for podcasts work this way, except for them, it's when the episode is published they'll hold on to it for a week and then they'll move it to their slower system because most downloads happen within that first week. Yeah, that's the thing to realize about caching is that at the end of the day, you can't rely on caching actually happening. You're telling the system that you would like for it to cache the content. You're telling the system Mm -hmm. for how long it's allowed to cache the content. But it can always decide to just not to cache or to cache for a shorter duration. Because, like you said, maybe it's run out of storage. It wants to keep something else instead. It's it's not frequently requested content, so it decides that there's really no point in caching it. For any one of those reasons and other, it, it, it might just not cache that content. Right. The, the difference, though, is that all of the uh, cache control settings, all of the e-tag stuff, all of the stuff that we've been talking about that you can throw into the header, you can control that if you control the the system that it's hitting, right? So you can set all that up in Nginx or Apache or Express or whatever. But when you move to a CDN, you don't have those controls anymore unless they give them to you. On the other hand, I do know that the CDNs often, very often do give you the ability to force a refresh, which mm-hmm. is something that you cannot do with a right. browser cache. So it, it's like there, there's benef- pluses and minuses. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, by the way, another... A completely different aspect of caching is that from what I've seen, people often cache assets, but they don't cache requests. So you can cache many things on the CDN. You can cache uh, requests that are not often updated, for example. And uh, you can cache uh, even uh, if you use server-side rendering, for example, it might be a good idea to cache the response from the server-side rendering if you can if you don't have anything dynamic there for example so uh, consider these things yeah we actually talked exactly about that in a recent podcast episode when we were talking about uh, the gemstack about the gemstack usually generating content and pushing it into cdn at uh, at build time and and then you're caching off uh, you're potentially indefinitely caching off of the result of a build but you could also use a different strategy like you just ex- described where you're using server-side rendering. So the first time that the content is requested, only then at runtime do you actually generate that content and then you push it into the CDN and it's cached from that point on. So yeah, you could use various sorts of, of caching strategies with on the server side, on the backend side, for sure. Is there anything else that somebody else wants to bring up before we... 
move ahead. One, this and maybe this isn't directly related, but indirectly related, a tangent, shall we say. Uh, when we're talking about CDNs and some of the things you can do on CDNs, I know that I've heard someone like Wes Boss talk about things like Cloudflare workers or basically code that you can run on the CDN to intercept requests as they come and before they get all the way back to the, the base of your application. Vitaly, I'm just curious to see if you've used these before or if they can be used within a caching structure or am I just completely off base on something irrelevant? I'm not sure if you're talking about what I'm thinking about, but from what I saw, you can configure the CDN to cache even dynamic content in uh, many cases. If uh, like smart CDNs can cache dynamic content based on uh, like headers and like uh, things that you return to the user. So that's what I saw. Yeah, we actually use that uh, kind of, again, Wix is big enough that we more or less try everything. And we also used uh, this sort of functionality of end, uh, computation at the edge. Uh, it's kind of adjacent to caching, I would say. The, the basic idea is that it just does the computation closer to the endpoint and in a more distributed sort of a way. And if you, where, if and when you can do that, it means that you need you can get you don't need to go as far in order to get the data. And also the computation is distributed across more servers, so also it can happen. It addresses scalability issues. But I, I look at it more as something that's adjacent to caching and not necessarily, I, I won't necessarily put it in the same bucket. I would like to mention one more thing, and that sometimes, like we said, that I gave one example of that or, or made a statement that you can tell a system how long you would like for something to be cached and according to what strategy, but it may do something else. It might decide to cache it for a shorter duration. Well, I would like just to mention that in some few cases, you might tell some a system not to cache something and it would still cache it. So we gave an example before that when you say no store, you're literally telling the browser don't cache this. Well, it turns out that in some cases, the browser will cache it despite you telling it not to cache it, at least for a really short duration. Uh, for example, if you prefetch a resource, even if that resource is marked as no store, it will be kept in a memory cache for a few minutes because otherwise prefetching would literally have no effect. So it's amusing how... This is a really weird and wacky world where we try to really control all the possible scenarios with in a declarative sort of a way. And then it turns out that we run into all sorts of sophisticated edge cases and, and whatnot. So and anyway. Yeah, the, the other scenario is what what you see if you don't use cache control at all. The thing that I started with, because for the first 10 days you will not have cache at all, usually. And then after a few weeks, your assets will, you will see that your assets are actually cached for a short amount of time. And after like a month or so, they will be cached for a few days and so on. So it's a very, very confusing behavior. And that's what essentially happened to me. I, I saw assets that look exactly the same. I couldn't understand what's the difference between them. Why some are cached and some... Uh, return 304 and use e-tags. And that was the difference. That for some reason, cache control disappeared and uh, we had to reconfigure it. Yeah, one of the things that, you know, when I'm asked to review a site, either for performance or in general even, one of the first things that I do is look at the, the, the cache control response headers for the resources. And very often, they're not what they're supposed to be. And it's a fairly quick win when you're able, an easy and cheap win, when you're able to get the proper behavior just by a slight change to the server response header. I think it's one of the things that fall between the chairs in many organizations, because from the one hand, the front-end developers are using the assets and usually they also upload them. But from the other hand, the backends don't really care about it in many organizations like it's not in their it's not their part 
So what happens is that your caching is not configured and it works uh, weirdly. Probably it hurts your performance. Probably it it costs you because your servers are used more instead of storing things on the user's computer. And it's something that I really encourage everybody to get to know because, because I know that there's a, a very little awareness of how the things work. So, oh, and mozilla.org HTTP caching section about the whole thing that I will be that I will add to the resources of the episode. They're amazing. J- just read the whole thing from start to end, and you will know pretty well how caching works. I think what you just said about how this can fall between the chairs is an excellent point. I think you kind of uh, hit the, the nail on the head here. I've definitely seen that type of a scenario. And in addition to that, very often, even if you have end to end tests, they won't identify caching problems because usually end-to-end tests use a fresh client. Uh, they, they spin up, let's say, a puppeteer instance or something like that. Mm-hmm. So caching doesn't even come into play. So, so yeah, it's definitely something that, you, that can be easily overlooked and really bite you if, if you don't properly configure it. Also because, correct me if I'm wrong then, but Google mostly cares about like the load speed of your website. So many people don't really care about the second time a user enters your website because of this reason. Yeah, that, we, we, we will probably do an episode about that in the future. People are now all hot to trot about performance because it's going to be an SEO ranking factor. We even had uh, Martin Schple to talk about it here from Google. But the reality is that as a ranking signal, it's probably going to be a fairly minor signal. People should care about performance because their visitors are impacted by performance. So even regardless of how well you rank, if your site has bad performance, you will get a high bounce rate. People will just abandon your site because it's slow to load. Yeah, uh, it's empir- empirically proven by like once and again by many great companies. Exactly. And having proper cache configuration on the one hand, is a great way to improve performance. And having an improper cache configuration is a great way of displaying wrong data and potentially having all sorts of uh, privacy issues if you're not careful. Now, I was under the impression that Google was actually backtracking some on ranking sites. I guess it was mobile performance. I read an article where their they're not going to rank sites as heavily based on mobile performance because who's what's the name of the law, whatever. As soon as you start measuring something as a metric, it becomes less useful for the thing for which you were measuring. People are abusing it and causing sites to be worse. And so Google's actually scaling back on it. Yeah, I don't know what that law is, but yeah, it makes sense though, right? They tell us they're measuring it, and so everybody starts gaming it. All right, I've got to uh, start us wrapping up because I have a call at noon, and I've got to feed my daughter between now and then, so that that gives us like 12 minutes. Let's go ahead and do picks. Hey, folks, if you love this podcast and would like to support the show, or if you wish you could listen without the sponsorship messages, then you're in luck. We're setting up new premium podcast feeds where you can get all of the episodes released after Christmas 2020 without the ads. Signing up will help us pay for editing and production, and you can go sign up at devchat.tv slash premium. Dan, are you in a position to do picks? Looks like he's not. Vitali, do you have some? Oh, we'll do you last because we always do the guests last. Steve, do you want to do some picks for us? Sure. I did want to point out that we have a little document that we use to gather notes for what we're going to talk about. And I had put some questions that got skipped. So I'll read one of them now. And this is very relative to caching. And it says, do sheep shrink when it rains? Mm. Uh, and so I actually have an answer to that. There's a great YouTube video that I found a number of years ago by a, a channel called Minute Earth. And it goes into great detail about why don't sheep shrink when it rains as compared to wool shrinking in the dryer. And it goes into detail about the, how the hairs rub together and the friction causes the drying, causes the shrinkage in the dryer versus when it's just out in the rain. So it's only a couple minutes long, but it's a very good scientific answer to the question that I know many people have lost sleep over at night. And then my other two uh, jokes for the day, or for the week, excuse me. One comes from Pun Bible, and it's just a simple question that says, 
why are they called territorial disputes and not ground beef? Something mm. to think about, right? And then Stand Up T-Rex has a good question about who is the patron saint of homeless dogs and cats? And it's Saint Ray, you know, Stray, Saint Ray. Anyway, those are my jokes for the day. And just a side note, hey, Alan, uh, I hope I sounded more like a smart guy than just a funny guy today. So I'm done. All right, AJ, what are your picks? All right, well, I got a couple of good ones, as always. First off, since we we did touch a little bit on Cloudflare workers, I think that's the name for them. So I'm going to link you all to a video that was, uh, it's a presentation, part of Utah Rust that has to do with Cloudflare workers and WASM and Rust. Cloudflare workers is not in the title of the video, but it is the example that was was being given for how to use basically Node through WASM on Cloudflare. And then I'm also, of course, going to pick uh, Beyond Code Bootcamp. For those of you that are interested in leveling up on your coding skills, I do live streams almost every day, except I'm on vacation right now and have terrible internet, so I haven't been able to to do that this week. But in general, I've got live streams going every weekday and I've got links in the show notes here for Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. If you've got any questions that you'd like me to answer or cover in a video at underscore beyond code on Twitter would be a great place to do it. And then I really think that it's important for people. I, I was doing something on resumes recently, you know, have a website where you put up your resume. Don't just hang it off of GitHub pages. Go that little bit of extra effort to have something that you know has a little bit better branding for yourself that goes on on uh, your resume and and whatnot. And I I have an affiliate link for Name.com, and it's in. I'm going to put the video for both when I'm going over how domains work, and I have an affiliate link for Name.com there, and then. The there's a video on how to set up your first server, and there is an affiliate link for two months free or a hundred dollars free on DigitalOcean there as well. So that's that's all my stuff for today. Awesome. All right, I'm going to jump on with a few picks of my own. The first one that I have is I'm just going to remind you all about the Dev Influencers Accelerator. If you're looking to kind of take your career to the next level, usually it's people trying to get into kind of a second career where they're they're replacing their full-time income, um, making a difference for the dev community, and being recognized as an expert while doing it. I mean, go check it out at devinfluencers.com slash apply, and that'll take you to a page where you can actually uh, apply to be part of the accelerator. The reason I make you apply is I just want to make sure that it's a good fit. Not everybody's in a, in a real good position for that, and I don't want people to go sign up and then you know have to back them out if they're not a good fit. I'd rather just talk to people and help them get ahead if they're not a good fit by giving them advice on where to go next. The next pick that I have, I've been listening to this book called Fanatical Prospecting. I've been kind of on a sales kick lately. And uh, I've really been enjoying that. It just talks about how to keep finding people to sell to. I do this for sponsorships. I do it for the Accelerator. And it's, it's really terrific. And then the last pick I have is Riverside FM. That's the system we're probably going to be moving to here within the next month to record on. It actually puts everybody on their own channel. It works through the web browser. It is so nice. There are a couple of kinks I have to figure out because you can only have one show recording on one account at a time. And most of our shows don't occur concurrently, so it's not a major issue. The only shows that are possible collisions are She's in Tech, which is our Women in Tech show. And and I just have to make sure that they're not recording when somebody else is really. So I'm going to pick that as well. And yeah, that's pretty much it for me. Vitali, what are your picks? All right. Well, well, Dan said there were sirens and it might mean that they all had to go cover. So, oh, that's right. Yeesh, that's a lot going on there. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't know if it was both of them or just one of them. There's a lot going on over there. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and wrap up here. Big thanks to Vitali for being here. And until next time, folks, Max out. Adios. Adios. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c a c h e f l y dot com to learn more. Surgeons keep our hearts beating. They do the amazing, help save lives, and so can you. 
Your CSL Plasma donation can help create 24 critical life-saving medicines that can give Grandpa the chance for his heart to swell when he meets his new grandson or give a bride the chance for her heart to skip a beat on her wedding day. Every plasma donation helps more than you know. Do the amazing. Help save lives. Donate today at your local CSL Plasma Center and be rewarded for your generosity. So, how does it feel when you play Roll Up to Win with Tim Hortons? Buy a hot or cold beverage using the Tim's app and find out. Roll in the app for a chance to win prizes ranging from free coffee and donuts to a Universal Orlando resort vacation or a sweet car. Oh, don't forget the TV. And this year, every roll is a shot at a $1,000 daily giveaway drawing for two $500 prizes. Roll up to win and get treated by Tim's. No purchase necessary. Account registration required. 50 US and DC. 18 plus entered by 4223. See rules at rolluptowin.com for free entry of full details. Void in Florida and where prohibited.